Today, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Now, you know from listening to this show that our money is broken. Fortunately, we have Bitcoin, a better money that will help us build a brighter future. But if you don't have a Bitcoin strategy and a trusted partner to help you execute that strategy, then you're probably going to fall behind. Now, I've known the Swan Bitcoin team for years. The Bitcoiners at Swan are mission driven and have deep expertise and respect in the Bitcoin space. In my opinion, this is the team you want on your side. Today, I'd like to highlight Swan's private client services division, which guides high net worth individuals and businesses around the world toward building and preserving wealth with Bitcoin. So visit swanprivate.com and learn how this concierge service gives you direct access to your dedicated Bitcoin advisor by phone, messaging, and email. Swan will guide you on complex areas such as self-custody, or you can choose to hold your Bitcoin through Swan with one of the largest US regulated custodians. So make your first purchase with Swan Private and get $100 of Bitcoin. Just tell them that I sent you. You know, an opportunity like this to build and preserve legacy impacting wealth for your family and company will not likely be seen again in our lifetimes. Sign up at swanprivate.com today, mention breed love to your advisor and get $100 in free Bitcoin when you make your first buy. Dan Roberts, welcome to the What Is Money show. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. Uh, I think the last time we saw each other was in Miami, I believe, for the conference. Yes, yeah. yes, believe so. Now we're on uh, opposite sides of the world again. <laughs> Yet connected by the miracle of technology. So... Dan, uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation because as I was telling you offline, Bitcoin mining is not an area that I have deep tactical knowledge on. And I know you are very well renowned for having that knowledge. So I'm hoping to get a little transfer mind share here today. Um, you are the co-founder and co-CEO of Iris Energy, which is a NASDAQ listed Bitcoin mining firm under the ticker IREN. Um, Maybe we could just start the old fashioned way and you could just give us a little bit of background about yourself, uh, you know, professionally, personally, and then how you got into Bitcoin and then into Bitcoin mining. Sure. Very happy to. And um, yeah, delighted to join the podcast. I've obviously listened to a lot of yours in the past and learned a lot. Uh, so yeah, very pleased to be here. Um, look, my background, very traditional um, infrastructure finance. So started life at PwC, um, then worked at the Australian Investment Bank Macquarie across Sydney and London, actually developing infrastructure projects, uh, renewable energy, wind and solar projects, particularly around Europe. And then about 10 years ago, jumped out of Macquarie into what was essentially a startup infrastructure funds management business. Uh, and that was right place, right time. We grew to around 6 billion in assets. So ports, airports, wind farms, solar farms, gas pipelines, uh, basically deploying long dated pension fund insurance company type money into unlisted infrastructure assets. Uh, about four years ago, I stepped back from my executive role there. We're still one of the largest shareholders, uh, but day to day started spending my time on uh, some more growth businesses, including Iris, which is uh, obviously snowballed during that time. Uh, in terms of the exposure to Bitcoin, uh, look, I think I first bought Bitcoin back in 2013 on the run up to $1,000. Uh, it crashed to 500. I thought this is nonsense, sold it all. Silly magic internet money. I, I was the silly one, obviously. Um, then went into the Ethereum uh, pre-sale uh, at 30 cents and obviously did pretty well out of that. Um, but it was kind of 2017, I think, that the penny dropped for myself and my brother, Will, who's also the co-founder and co-CEO of Iris around what Bitcoin actually uh, is, as we've, you know, there's been a lot of coverage uh, online and a lot of uh, commentary around it today. But back then it felt like that was the pivot point at which um, we at least uh, understood it for what we think it is. It's very interesting. You know, that's remarkably similar to my path, actually getting into Bitcoin 2014, actually, I think initially bought it, actually sold it and made money, thought I was a genius, never looked at it again. And then it wasn't until around 2017, studying Ethereum, 
getting to the concept of smart contracts, that was my big light bulb moment. And that's when I started making allocations into the space. And the rest is history. I've just been going down the rabbit hole ever since. So um, it, it does seem a not uncommon exposure to the asset class. And the mind does race as to, you know, the world's now seen 2017. The world's now seen 2021, 2022. They're getting conditioned to that volatility. Are they starting to explore it? What does this mean for future cycles? It's fascinating. Yeah, it really is. And then, um, so you got in in 17. I imagine you had a similar experience of just consuming as much content as possible to learn as quickly as you could initially. That's right. Yes. Uh, look, all, all the... There's a lot of good publications out there. Um, the Sovereign Individual, Safe Dean's um, work, um, you know, Nick Carter. Um, and look, there are a couple of others as well at the time that were uh, super helpful. Um, and, and I think that the greatest insight was just tracking through the origins and the history of money. If yeah. I had any other advice for someone coming to the space, try to ignore what you hear in crypto and mm -hmm. what you hear um, in the broader sector, there's a lot of noise, a lot of information, a lot mm -hmm. of misinformation. Mm -hmm. But if you just go back to the fundamental question of what is money and broaden your time horizon more than a couple of decades or even a century, mm -hmm. it really opens your mind. Yeah, I could not agree more with that, hence the name of the show. <laughs> so I appreciate you reinforcing that. Um, what So in that in your studies of Bitcoin initially, were you led directly to Bitcoin mining as, as wanting to be a participant in that space or how did that come about for you? No, not at all. Um, in fact, Bitcoin mining was all the, always this kind of obtuse abstract concept, this perception that it was cutthroat, um, highly competitive. You had to be located in China or Asia, um, really low cost power, and it was a really difficult industry to crack. So it never really hit the radar. Um, but towards the end of 2017, mid 2018, when I guess the penny dropped for Will and I, we thought, how do we do more in Bitcoin? Like this asset is just fascinating. It's a one and zero invention. It's probably going to go down with the printing press in terms of its impact um, on humanity. And how do we get closer to it? And it was through that process, we started to look into what Bitcoin mining was. And it was really hard. It was really hard to talk to people. No one seemed to be able to explain it. So we started experimenting with it, started modeling it out. And what we discovered was it was an energy game and it was increasingly the competitive advantage in the space was about to flip. And we can get onto that a little bit later on, but the really large opportunity we saw was one, at our infrastructure fund and given my professional background, a lot of exposure to renewable energy, particularly wind and solar. So these Western economies, Europe, Australia, where you saw supply side decarbonisation policies just pushing intermittent renewables onto these networks in the absence of a price signal. And what this did was create enormous instability and none of us foreshadowed it or saw it coming. But what you've seen is the perfect storm over the last decade in these Western markets where you've got declining manufacturing industrial loads built out of intermittent renewables, built out of intermittent uh, residential rooftop solar PV, lowering net retail demand. So not only are these markets desperate for additional incremental load to come into the network, they also need to solve that system flexibility issue, the time of day production. When the wind blows, the sun shines, there's an abundance of electrons in these networks. But when there's a weather event or a network outage, that's when the networks are really starting to struggle and why we're seeing so much of a narrative for both Bitcoin mining with the demand response today, um, but battery technologies, pump storage, hydro, et cetera. So I guess what we saw was the intersection of Bitcoin and renewable energy and said, whoa, Hang on, there is an opportunity to solve two problems here. One is support energy markets and the volatility in these markets. Two, support the Bitcoin network and contribute to the decarbonization and security of that network. Bring the two together. And even better, it's a highly profitable enterprise. 
my brother, Will, who I've mentioned a couple of times, his background was also at Macquarie uh, in their banking division, basically doing structured derivatives, loans into traditional mining businesses. So gold, copper, iron ore. He was involved in setting up their digital asset team back in 2017. You know, trade Bitcoin on the CME futures, invest in balance sheet in Bitcoin mining. And with that commodities background, my renewable energy and infrastructure background, the deep dive we'd done on Bitcoin, it kind of all came together and we said, well, there is an enormous opportunity. And as we get on to how the market for Bitcoin mining has changed, the changing nature of competitive advantage in the sector and the outlook for it, it really, the penny dropped. And we said, this is just a too bigger opportunity to pass up. Hmm. Interesting. So let, maybe let's just start very high level and then we'll kind of zoom into Bitcoin mining itself. But I noticed uh, when I was preparing for this interview, you have this great pinned tweet thread on your Twitter profile. And it's just very simple. What is Bitcoin mining? So, and it seemed it was, it was uh, communicated in very simple language. I think you may have actually, uh, you've done a great job of explaining this to no coiners, I think. So how, g- given such a simple, seemingly simple question is that, how do you explain Bitcoin mining to someone that's totally foreign to this space? Yeah, and look, for us, it was hard, right? People throw terms like Merkel trees and SHA-256 and your head implodes. Like, I'm not a technical guy. Um, But when you strip it back, it's not complex. Ultimately, um, the analogy I'd use is if you go to the casino and the dealer puts a pile of chips in the middle of the table and says, first person to roll two sixes wins the pile of chips. That is it. That's Bitcoin mining. Every 10 minutes, The protocol generates a random number. All these computers around the world use trial and error brute force to guess that random number. First computer to do so wins a few hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. Process starts again. There is no edge. It is entirely probabilistic. The more computers you have, the more Bitcoin you will receive. If you've got 1% of the global hash rate or the global network dedicated to securing Bitcoin, you get 1% of the Bitcoin. It's as simple as that. So really, you buy the computers, you plug them in, they use electricity as an input, they generate Bitcoin, which we liquidate daily, and the spread between it is your profit. It's beautiful, simple. Casino analogy resonates with a lot of people. Uh, I've also heard it put that hashes are like lottery tickets in a way. You're just generating a guess for this trying to roll two sixes, as you said, and then every 10 minutes-ish, someone wins and they start again. Um, So this is probably a good point to touch on because that implies that there's risk attached to mining um, mm -hmm. in the sense that it is a probability game. You are finding a needle in a haystack. You're trying to... um, But the way the market structure actually works is market solve problems is through these mining pools So as a miner, you can direct your hash rate to any number of these online mining pools. And what they do is they aggregate all the individual miners into a group, and then they mine and run the numbers on your behalf. So if you're part of a mining pool that controls around, call it 10% of the global network, then on average, every hour and a half, two hours, they're finding the block, right? And then all they do is allocate the Bitcoin reward they receive on a proportionate basis to all the contributors to the mining pool and take that risk or luck element out of it for you. In fact, it gets better. These mining pools, actually a number of them, including the ones we use, guarantee you a fixed daily payout in Bitcoin directly corresponding to the amount of computing power that you generate. So we don't even take any of that dice rolling analogy risk and there's infrastructure backgrounds it's all about risk for us like why would we take risk on that what we're good at is building owning and operating these proprietary data centers generating as much bitcoin as we can as efficiently as we can from our capex base if someone else is willing to take on that risk and pay us call it 99.5 percent of the expected amount of bitcoin then that makes sense yeah it makes a lot of sense um and those i, I get 
the Bitcoin mining pools exist basically to smooth out the revenue profile, right? Versus if you're doing it on your own, you might not discover a block much, much uh, less frequently, I guess, than via participating in a pool. Is that the general idea? Spot on. Yeah. So they will pay you a fixed daily payout in Bitcoin directly corresponding to the amount of computing power you generate. The alternative is as an individual miner with a single ASIC at home, you might find a Bitcoin tomorrow. You might find one in six months. You might find one in 18 months, but it, it right. is a lottery ticket if you go down that path. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. What is, so you mentioned, um, clearly this is a very capital intensive industry. You're deploying a lot of these, uh, this mining equipment and you're, you're using a lot of electricity as, as your OPEX. What is the relationship here? People, because a lot of people outside this space often decry Bitcoin mining as a waste of energy, which is kind of a separate topic. But what I'm trying to get to here is what is the relationship between Bitcoin mining CapEx and Bitcoin price? How do these two sort of interact over time? Great question. And yes, you can go down the rabbit hole on um, Bitcoin being a waste of energy and start talking about um, washing machines and uh, Christmas lights and all that sort of stuff, but you, you kind of lose that argument. Um, well, you don't lose it, but people just don't want to engage on any fundamental level. The only reason Bitcoin uses energy is because the market values Bitcoin. And to people that think Bitcoin is a waste of energy, the response is simple. The moment Bitcoin ceases to have any value is the moment that zero energy is dedicated towards securing it. It's perfectly correlated. In terms of the mining incentives to deploy CapEx and OpEx, um, and coming back to your direct question, um, look, the, the way it essentially works, if we come back to how we described what Bitcoin mining is, is every 10 minutes, there is that bounty available for the global mining pool. So it's currently 6.25 Bitcoin, plus any transaction fees accruing during that 10-minute uh, block. Now, if the price of Bitcoin goes up, then the fiat denominated rewards in that 10 minute block go up accordingly. Now, what that does is improve returns and yield for incumbent miners. If you were making 100% cash yield before, Bitcoin price goes up 50%, all of a sudden you're making 150% annualized returns. Happy days. But as a true market, that incentivizes not only you, but others to consider investing in new capacity to get a share of that digital pie every 10 minutes because the reward is now higher. So what that does, it means that as the Bitcoin price goes up, the incentive to deploy more capital in chips, data centers, power infrastructure, and build all the capacity goes up accordingly. Now, where that then leaves you is with an OPEX line at an industry level because it costs money for electricity. So another way to conceptualize it is that 6.25 Bitcoin plus transaction fees is your global revenue line. Then there's an amount of money that the market will spend on power to get access to that revenue line. Yes, you've got to amortize your CapEx as part of that equation, but you've then got to make sure that your operating margin, your gross profit margin, i.e. the spread between your power cost and your revenue line being the price of Bitcoin is sufficient to generate a return on that capital over time. And it's if you understand how that then works, you can then start to analyze, well, how's that changing over time with the absolute size of Bitcoin now growing to an order of magnitude we haven't seen before? How is that changing in the context of hardware efficiency and the plateauing of the technology curve there. And, and it all becomes quite fascinating as you play it out. Yeah, really interesting stuff there. So we, I think today, we're approximately at a new all-time high in Bitcoin hash rate, or we have been in the past couple of weeks. Uh, we're recording this in late June, 2022. Um, yet the Bitcoin price is it at a significant drawdown percentage from its recent local all-time high of, I think we're at 69,000. Today we're trading around 20 or 21. How do you, is there, again, the relationship there is, is hash rate a leading, a lagging indicator? Is it neutral to Bitcoin price? Like in the, 
in the long run, how do you see the dynamics playing out between the two? Do you consider Bitcoin hash rate again to be kind of a leading indicator of price or lagging? Like how do you how do you view that dynamic? Hash rate follows price unequivocally. Like there is no debate and there should not be. And we can step through exactly why. The one concession I make on that is there may be a second order, third order effect where increasing hash rate means greater security for the Bitcoin network, which incentivizes more people to store their wealth in Bitcoin. Right. But I, I think that's a, you know, a slightly stretched argument compared to the primary factor. So if we, let, let's use some real world examples and numbers now. So we go back to how the incentives for Bitcoin mining work in terms of people bringing online more hash rate in response to a higher price. Because if the rewards are higher every 10 minutes, then people want to bring on more mining supply to get a piece of that pie every 10 minutes. Now, if we go back through the history of mining, when Bitcoin was small, it was easy for the hash rate to keep pace with the price. You know, price goes up you know, from $300 to $1,000, there might have been, I'm making it up, 10, 20 megawatts of power. You know, the world can respond and find 10, 20, 30 megawatts of power, chips, capital, bring online more supply and normalize yields for all the participants. But when we started this business or before we did, we went back and modeled every cycle that we'd seen in Bitcoin and how long and hard it took for the hash rate to keep pace with the price during these parabolic run-ups. And what we observed was that it was getting longer and harder every cycle because Bitcoin was getting bigger and the numbers were getting bigger. The real world can't scale exponentially indefinitely. You start encountering real world issues and the bigger Bitcoin gets, the bigger those issues become. So if you go back to the 2017 bull market, which we've spoken about, you know, Bitcoin peaked around December, 2017. The hash rate didn't catch the price to normalize those profits until around August, September, the following year. And that was after Bitcoin fell 70%. You now fast forward, but rewind, fast forward to this cycle where we're sitting here two and a half, three years ago. Bitcoin's at eight to $10,000. The market's normalized. There's about eight gigawatts of power securing this network. Bitcoin then goes on another 5x run, it goes up to 40, 50 grand, even overshot and went a little bit higher, but let's go with 40, $50,000. In that dynamic with eight gigawatts of power as your starting base, to now try and normalize profits for all mining participants, you now need 30 gigawatts of power. The entire global data center industry is like 23, 24. Wow. $70, 70 billion dollars of capital. It just doesn't exist in this industry. And then finally, even if you get all that power, you get the social license to operate, you actually find it, you build out the grid connections, transformers, all that long lead item stuff, you get the capital, you're still going to be waiting four, five, six, seven years of full manufacturing production of these specialized chips out of Asia in the middle of a semiconductor shortage where people literally can't build cars. So what this led us down to was this, this, this fundamental dislocation between the real world and the digital world. As a miner, your revenue line is the digital world, the price of Bitcoin, an exponential technology. Your ability to get a piece of that exponential pie is fundamentally constrained by now large scale energy infrastructure projects. And we know how long these take to bring online. You can't walk up to a high voltage transmission line and plug a toaster in. In some markets, it can take two, three, four years. Go and negotiate with a farmer, get a block of land, go and go through your grid connection approvals, your planning, your permitting, your long lead items of transformers, substations, like it takes years. And particularly in a sector that's been dominated by such a high time preference where if you can't get power in the next two to three months, it kind of doesn't mean anything. I think the ability to start forecasting where this goes on a multi-year time frame can actually lead to some competitive advantage because you're putting in the time and the effort to lock up those sites, lock up that power, knowing that it's likely inevitable that Bitcoin's going to get to a level that incentivizes the build out of those sites. That's super interesting. It 
I mean, it harkens back to Bitcoin inducing you to have a lower time preference again, right? Taking a longer view on where Bitcoin mining is going um, and skating to where the puck is going to be. A lot of great points there. And then, you know, Sailor made this point too on the show that that's also what that dislocation you describe between digital and physical reality, that's what protects Bitcoin from sudden 51% attacks, for instance. Like it's really hard to spin up 51% of the network overnight. If I mean, it's impossible, frankly, right? As you're describing these these lead times with chip manufacturer um, subsequent to every other hurdle that you have to clear. So that's really interesting. Um, Maybe a couple so, of points on that, yeah. um, Robert. So the the 51% attack, you're in, entirely right. Like to spin up 51% is next to impossible now, given the size. Um, what Bitcoin does, Bitcoin mining does, is essentially layer down this protocol in digital concrete every 10 minutes by virtue of that energy expenditure. And that's what gives it its immutability censorship resistance because once that block is found and the miners and that 8, 10 gigawatts of power moves on to the next block, good luck. Like that is cemented in stone forever. Mm -hmm. Like the laws of physics basically preclude you from unwinding that so it's fundamental to the operation of, of Bitcoin and the security of all those attributes that we love. In terms of a 51% attack, like 51% attacks, they don't work. Like there's so much misinformation around there. So you play out what happens if you actually get 51% of the hash rate. Like it's never going to happen, but let's play it out. Right. And we've actually seen this on a lot of lower market capitalization coins. All you can do as a 51% attacker is control what's in the next block which means you can censor transactions. So if you've got 51%, there are two things you can do. You can double spend your own transactions or you can censor other people's transactions. Let's deal with them sequentially. You want to censor other people's transaction. Be my guest. You find the next block, censor them. You don't get the revenue. You find the next block, censor them. Don't get the revenue. You find three in a row with 51% of the network. Probability is against you, but it's certainly feasible and you probably will have periods. Censor the transactions. And guess what? 49%, someone in that group finds the fourth block. They collect all the transaction fees. So all of a sudden, the economic incentives work completely against you. Why would you do it? And what are you actually achieving by attacking the network? Nothing. The second aspect is being able to double spend your own coins. Now, this would be the classic playbook that people talk about would be, I've got 100 Bitcoin. I send that to an exchange. I then sell those Bitcoin, buy something else, whether it's US dollar tether or some other coin. I then withdraw the other coin and then I rewind the blockchain back to where it was before. So I keep my 100 Bitcoin and I get to keep the coins that I've sold. Now, all of a sudden, like how much time is it going to take? Like most exchanges will make you wait at least, you know, three, four, six blocks before they'll register a transaction on it. And then you're spending all this energy and expenditure to try and fight the other 49% to rewind the blockchain. And there's a whole probability associated with that, which makes it really unlikely that you'll actually outpace those 49%. And what have you achieved? You've spent the equivalent of billions of dollars of annualized expenditure on energy to double spend 100 Bitcoin. Now, maybe you've got 10,000 Bitcoin and it makes you slightly worthwhile, but you, you start playing this out and it's like, it doesn't matter. Like maybe if someone got 90% of the global hash rate, then the probabilities start to skew. But the, comp the probability that that's ever going to happen is so unlikely given the size of the industry and how geographically di distributed it is. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Great way to lay it out. And then I, I guess an important point here is that mining pools are not controlling that portion of hash rate, right? Even if you had a mining pool that represented 90% of the global hash rate, that doesn't mean they control it. Um, because a lot of people now, like again, to point to another that. another misconception. Yeah, yeah, another misconception. You spot on. There is a drop-down box in the software where we can reroute the hash rate at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. Like you are not beholden to any mining pool. They are a service provider. They are a commodity. There is any number of one of them. You can change at the drop of a hat. We had an instance about six months ago where we were using one mining pool the web page went down. We couldn't see our live hash rate. We tried to contact them, couldn't immediately get in contact. 
So we switched our hash rate to another provider. Now, as it emerges, it was just their front end display that went down. They were mm -hmm. still recognizing the hashing capacity. But as part of our business continuity planning, it's very easy just to change between the mining pools. So to play out the point you're trying to make is the moment one mining pool goes rogue and starts wanting to do something silly with the Bitcoin network, it's like, oh, we're out of here. It's our mm -hmm. hash rate. Right. Yeah. Excellent point. And it's so fascinating to me that even as a 51% attacker, you're still incentivized to behave honestly, to interact honestly, right? Just, um, that's the magic of Bitcoin, really. It just incentivizes everyone at every level to be honest, which is something we desperately need in the world, obviously. <laughs> and um, I guess the last point there is that the proponents of the 51% attack is like a viable attack vector. They always completely discount any adaptive response by the other 49%, as you're saying. And I, I just think that is so short-sighted. I mean, it's not like people are just going to sit around on their laurels while, while the network is under attack. I mean, every participant in Bitcoin has so much skin in the game, so much capital, time, effort tied up in this. It's obvious that they, they would fight to protect the network uh, under circumstances such as that. Absolutely. And it's, it's funny, say so, because... Bitcoin to me is this game theoretic perfect structure where it's just cracked the ultimate game theory where every incentive points towards securing the network and supporting it. You can't beat it. You have to join it at some point. And that goes at multiple levels. I remember there was a, um, this is probably only a few weeks ago now, someone, someone published an article basically claiming that early Bitcoin miners and network participants were behaving really altruistically to support the network. They had the opportunity to attack it, chose not to. That's a weakness in Bitcoin's design. And I think Nick Carter uh, tore shreds off it. But it comes back to people don't behave altruistically in a market environment. People behave according to their self-interests. And that's what Bitcoin thrives on. Your interest as an individual participant in that network is to support the asset, support the network, because that's what benefits you most. And once you realize you can't attack it, you can't benefit from trying to fight it, you end up joining it and having to support it, which just feeds on itself and creates that network effect. Yeah, it's beautifully said. I like the descriptor, a perfect game theoretic structure. Um, I've had a similar revelation about Bitcoin. I described it as a vortex of positive incentives. You just can't escape it, right? Like you're, you're paid to help the network proliferate and you can ignore that and fight it and resist it as long as you want. But Bitcoin just keeps on chugging along, keeps on recruiting new talent, time, energy, capital. Uh, so at some point, yeah, you just, you're forced into that old adage. If you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> Absolutely. And if you strip that back to the macro and say Bitcoin as an asset, if you can't beat it, join them. You've got an asset that is perfectly scarce. There is only 21 million. That won't change. We have never as humanity seen anything like this. You look at the supply curve of gold in comparison as the scarcest asset, it's going parabolic. 1.8% year on year compounds pretty quickly on a long-term timeframe. So you've got this asset where there's only 21 million Every four years, the supply gets cut in half to get to that cap. And then you say, well, the longer it survives, the lower the perceived risk, because it's got that longevity, attracts the marginal buyer, price goes up, the increased price attracts a new set of participants, and you get that kind of rolling network effect and positive reinforcing cycle. And then you zoom out and you look at central bank money printing, quantitative easing, all the stuff we know that's happening in the world today, which mainstream is now starting to accept the death of currencies like they're spiraling and you go wow you've got two exponential functions colliding what do you think is going to happen you've got the exponential scarcity of bitcoin with the supply schedule starting to plateau and then you've got the exponential supply of us dollars and fiat currencies and those two things are intersecting like what is going to happen like there is only one outcome in my mind if unless a black swan comes out of somewhere and takes down Bitcoin. And I just don't see how that can happen because the incentive to take down Bitcoin has been there in an open market with multi-billion dollars of bounty for anyone that can do it for 12 years. So it is fascinating when you play it out and it just feels like it just takes time and um, awareness.
Yeah, there's excellent framing. And I'm reminded of that quote that the greatest shortcoming of man is our inability to understand the exponential function. And it is indeed a collision of two exponential functions, the exponential decay of Bitcoin's new issuance with the exponential expansion of fiat currency. I mean, it's going to be fireworks, I think. <laughs> So um, someone asked me this to make this point on exponential functions. Someone said to me, it's probably a year ago. I forget who it was. Um, if, if I have an A4 piece of paper and I fold it in half on itself 50 times, yes, it's going to get pretty tough. But let's say we did that in theory. How tall do you think or how thick do you think that piece of paper? So you fold it in half 50 times. And I said, I don't know, a meter, two meters. Said, two thirds of the distance from here to the sun. Like, what? <laughs> that can't be right. So of course, went on to Google, started looking at the width of A4 piece of paper, um, ran the numbers, it's right. Like the mind yeah. boggles. Like, it just, you can't comprehend this stuff. Yeah, we're not wired to deal with non-linear math. That is for sure. Um, maybe this is a good time to go into the energy and the wastefulness that, uh, at least the designation of wastefulness that's commonly hurled at Bitcoin. I think you touched on this earlier, but maybe you could expand upon it a bit. How do you explain the necessity of Bitcoin's mining energy expenditure? Or said another way, how do you explain the necessity of proof of work for viable um, money? So proof of work and Bitcoin mining is what tethers this digital asset to the real world. It's what gives it weight. And it comes back to that comment we made earlier around every 10 minutes, this Bitcoin mining energy expenditure when it finds a block is layering down that block in digital concrete. Like it's just laying it down in stone because of all that energy that is being expended to find that block. To unwind the chain, you need to find the equivalent of eight, 10 gigawatts worth of power and then fight through that 51% attack type structure that we mentioned earlier. So Bitcoin mining is fundamental to Bitcoin because it's what ensures 21 million. It's what ensures no one can tamper with the blockchain, sensor transactions, all those attributes um, that gives Bitcoin value. And people often say to me, say, well, why is Bitcoin got value? And I said two things. One, scarcity. There's only 21 million. Put yourself 20 years into the future and look back and go, does it make sense that we've got a digitally native currency that's scarce and can't be printed in a world that's becoming increasingly digital? Uh, and as a further adjunct to that, look at your kids. Uh, you know, I've got five kids under the age of nine and I kind of look at it and go, they're going to be playing computer games, dealing with online currencies, whether it's Bitcoin or other things. They're going to get to the age of 18. I can say, guess what, guys? You get to open a bank account. What's that, dad? Well, I'll tell you what, Monday morning, we can't go today because today's Saturday, but Monday morning at 10 a.m., the bank's going to open and we can go in there. We can only go between 10 and four. And I know you've got school, but maybe we can race there after school. And then we'll have to fill out 11 forms and we'll have to sign them in. But like, it's just like, it just makes so much sense, right? And then the second aspect um, is this open global settlement network, which Jack Mollers has done a great way of explaining because I don't... I think the easy thing is to look at the 21 million Bitcoin as gold 2.0 and go scarcity has value because you can transport your value across space and time. But the open settlement network is fascinating in a world where it's becoming increasingly harder to use traditional institutions, like even for the average punter, to use the global SWIFT settlement system costs you like $35 in three days. And then people go and whinge about 10 minute block times. Like, dude, like look at what you're actually competing with. And that's not where Bitcoin's meant to compete, right? In payments, but as an open global settlement system, it's certainly got a lot of value. Yeah, well said. I, I'm reminded, I mean, first of all, the, the way you describe that, right? The, how uh, uneconomic is it to engage with a banking system like that, that we can only go in on weekdays, we've got to fill out the forms. You know, my recent experiences with the banking system have been increasingly worse too. like to even send a wire now small wires too. you get all these questions and stoppages and delays. Uh, and it just 
feels very antithetical to private property, right? The money in the bank is supposed to be yours. You earned it. It's your private property. You can spend it as you please, but it doesn't doesn't seem that way anymore. Um, one angle I've taken with the Bitcoin mining uh, proof of work is that, well, if you want money that you can't counterfeit, then why don't you peg it to the one thing in the universe nobody can counterfeit, which is energy itself. And I, I think that's pretty much what Satoshi did. Um, so I think that's a really good way of putting it, Robert. And that's been the innovation, right? How do you tether something real world, something scarce, something expensive to a digital asset? And proof of work is the innovation that led to this whole space. And lots of people talk about proof of stake and these other consensus mechanisms. Like, good luck to them. Absolutely. Like a lot of these other coins are trying to solve different problems. Many of those problems I don't actually understand, but let's, let's say there is a lot of use case in them. They probably do need a different way to secure the network to allow the function of what their network's trying to achieve. But to your point, as base layer money, being able to transfer kilowatt hours into a scarce monetary asset, is that's the innovation. Henry Ford tried to do launch Bitcoin 100 years ago. You might have seen the article, front yeah. page of the New York Times. He actually yeah. came out and said he's trying to launch an energy current currency linked to kilowatt hours to take currency and monetary debasement out of the hands of government. He didn't have the technology that we have today. Yeah, I think in that headline too, it said something about fixing warfare as well, right? He thought if you could create this energy currency, it would, um, I guess, at least diminish the means of war financing through inflation and things like that. Super interesting. What a prescient guy. Now I'd like to tell you about a great new Bitcoin show on the scene that you've got to check out. Brought to you by Swan Studios and Bitcoin Magazine, this show is Hard Money with Natalie Brunel. Natalie is an Emmy-nominated journalist bringing unparalleled experience to the Bitcoin media scene. And personally, Natalie is one of my favorite voices in the Bitcoin space. Each week on Hard Money, you'll get the top headlines of the week with analysis you won't find anywhere else. Hard-hitting interviews with amazing guests like myself and other top minds in the Bitcoin space. And the show will take you directly into the lives being changed by Bitcoin all over the world. Check out Hard Money at swan.com backslash hard money. Today, I want to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. So how does health insurance work? You send an egregious amount of money to an insurance company. They hold it in a pool of depreciating fiat currency. Then when you have a large health event, you have to pay them even more via your deductible, and then you hope they will cover your bill. And in fact, one in six bills are denied by healthcare.gov plans. It's time to take control of your own healthcare bills. I'd like to introduce you to CrowdHealth. It's a decentralization of healthcare using Bitcoin as an alternative to health insurance. Instead of sending fiat currency to a big corporation, you send that money to an account controlled by you, a portion of which is converted into Bitcoin. Then if you have a big health event, you have a community of Bitcoiners that will use the money in their accounts to help you out. To get more details, go to joincrowdhealth.com backslash breedlove, where you can find the promo code for $99 a month for six months. Another thing about Bitcoin mining that's interesting, and a lot of people have described it as like the energy buyer of last resort. Um, or I've also heard it described as like a global bounty program for unused or underused energy sources. One of the big advantages here, and please correct me anywhere I'm wrong, but it seems like it's the, uh, that Bitcoin mining can be easily interrupted, right? You can easily turn it on when uh, the market, I guess market energy prices are such that it's advantageous to mine but you can very easily switch it off and sell it back into the grid or battery storage, whatever you're doing with it when, when that price profile changes. Is that a key element of Bitcoin mining and its utility uh, in energy markets? Is this dynamic interruptibility, if you will? Absolutely. And we go back to what um, attracted us to the opportunity. It was seeing the issues in these Western energy markets associated with wind and solar coming online in the absence of a market price signal 
for those assets. And what you end up with is these huge amount of periods of abundant renewable energy. You look at markets around the world, Texas has them, Australia has them, where you have large periods of negative power prices because the wind's blowing, the sun's shining, pumping that power into the network. Often it's curtailed and doesn't even get into the network. And then you get a weather event or a network outage or some other, other exogenous factor impacting the network. And all of a sudden there's no power and it can't respond. You can't spin up another gas-fired peaking power station or you haven't got baseload fossil fuels. And that's where Bitcoin mining came to the fore because a lot of these markets have tried to find demand response and load flexibility in the indu existing industrial users. And you've got examples, programs, I think there's one in Australia in one of the northern states where there's pool pump uh, demand response products where if you agree to plug your pool pump into this demand response, you'll get paid for it. But it's obviously such a small scale. The advantage of Bitcoin mining, to come to your point, is while the machines are on, they're generating Bitcoin. When they're off, they're not. There's no customer contracts, no uptime guarantees, no consequential loss. It is as simple as they are taking energy, printing Bitcoin, or they're not. In fact, it gets better than that. I'm misleading because you can actually throttle the frequency on these chips and dynamically reduce or increase their energy consumption. So you might have heard of underclocking and overclocking of ASICs. All that's doing is adjusting the frequency of the chips and how quickly that signal is going between the transistors. So you can just underclock the chips, so dial them down. You know, let's say you've got 100 megawatts of capacity. The market needs a bit of power because by definition, how power prices are high, it doesn't make sense for you to operate. You just throttle down the chips, call it 70%. Go back to 30 megawatts of load, give that 70 megawatts back to the market that needs it by definition because they're bidding for high power prices. You not only avoid having to pay that high power price and boost your operating margins, but that you're then in often paid in these markets additional revenue lines because you're providing that insurance. You're providing that kind of load or um, service as last resort where the market operator knows, you know, if shit hits the fan and we've got a shortage of power, wowee, RS Energy, wowee, any other Bitcoin miner in that market can respond and liberate that power for the broader community. Wow, I did. I'd not heard of underclocking and overclocking. That's super interesting. So it's more than just on or off. You can actually dial it down or dial it up uh, based on market dynamics. That's really interesting. Um, in your, I'm sure you talk to a lot of people in the energy industry about it. Is that an approach you take? Is that Bitcoin really is just this global decentralized organization for that buys energy? Right. It's got an open checkbook for buying energy all the time. Yeah, it is. It is. And then um, as a buyer of that energy, a Bitcoin miner, you've then got to go through a decision matrix around where do you want to locate your facilities? How do you want to operate? And for us, it's always been about longevity, sustainability and risk and not sustainability per se in a green sense. I mean, that's certainly part of it. That's where the market, that's what society wants, but it's sustainability and longevity of operations. And this is why, if you look at what IRIS has created, you know, it's built as an institutional grade exposure to this asset class. We are building multi-decade assets, proper data centers. We don't do shipping containers. We don't do hosting. We don't do leases. We don't go behind the meters and borrow other people's substations. We build, own and operate everything, the land, the infrastructure, the substations, the proprietary data centers, our computers, we own and operate the full stack. We directly interface with the market, the energy market, as a market participant to provide those services directly to the market. Not only does that mean that we've got fantastic efficiency of operations and we've got a low risk exposure because we can stay online and we're not reliant on counterparties, our cost base drops as well because we're investing the time, the money up front to basically buy that certainty and that control. So when power prices go up in markets like we're seeing at the moment because of commodity prices, as a direct market participant, we can just trade. You can trade off the opportunity cost of giving that power back to the market and help alleviating that supply shortage, 
or you can monetize that power into Bitcoin. So it's providing a fantastic service. Wow, really interesting. Um, or are you guys operating in both regulated and unregulated markets or are you just in one of the two? No, so we um, today our first three projects are in British Columbia, Canada, which is a regulated market. And then we've announced a 600 megawatt project in Texas, which is unregulated. And they're actually very different markets in terms of the problems that we're solving. So we step back, one of the founding basis of, of this business was not only are we going to target 100% renewables, which we've obviously been since inception, but we will only enter a market where our incremental load in that market is solving a problem, is delivering positive externalities, creating a social good. So in unregulated markets like Texas, other Western economies, this is the demand response, the flexibility in load. Go and locate close to the source of low cost renewables, support them, but equally when power prices peak, don't go stealing power away from other users. Give that power back to the market. By definition, it's not as profitable for us to operate. Um, so if you look at where our Texas project is located up in the Panhandle region of Texas, there's something like 32 gigawatts of wind and solar up there, but the transmission line capacity is only like 12 gigawatts to actually export that load down to the load centers in the Southeast around Dallas and Houston. So there's an enormous amount of spilt power, negative pricing power, but when the market wants that power down South, you just switch your facilities down, let those electrons trans travel down the transmission lines to those load centers. Now in regulated markets like British Columbia, it's a really different problem that we're solving. So if we look at BC, they have got an enormous amount of hydropower. 98% of their market is renewable energy, the majority of which is hydro. Now, the issue they've faced is they're still building large scale hydro in the north of the province, Site C, signed off many years ago. You know, it's gone over time, over budget, um, coming online. But like I alluded to before, Demand's been destroyed through the destruction of industry in these Western economies. The pulp and paper industry is closed down. So you've had the largest user of electricity in that province disappear in the face of increasing supply. Now in an unregulated market, happy days, abundance of power, low power prices for everyone. In a regulated market, it is counterintuitively the entirely opposite phenomenon. Power prices must go up because in a regulated market, the owner of that generation and transmission line capacity is entitled at law to earn a prescribed return on all the investment that they've made in their asset base, regardless of how many people are using it. So if there are less wow. people now using the generation, less people now using the transmission, guess what? That cost base is now spread across that lower number of people. So in infrastructure world, you often hear the term death spiral or regulatory death spiral where you see these regulated assets have a lower utilization because of some factor that's impacted the market. That results in higher prices for all the existing participants. The existence of those higher prices then causes others to close down and go out of business. So the number of users shrinks again and so on and so on. So this is the issue, it's a really big problem. So what we've done is go into that province uh, we've partnered with a gentleman by the name of Brian Fair, Canadian industrialist, built a very large construction business, Order of British Columbia, worked in the pulp and paper industry, and basically gone to a number of the sites where these pulp mills have closed down, leveraged the electrical infrastructure, the sunk capacity in the network, build out new facilities, rehire a number of the local employees that were obviously laid off, and importantly, pay a market price for power, deliver BC Hydro with an alternative revenue line so they don't need to go and raise power prices to mums and dads and other industries to recover the regulated return that they're entitled to under law. Wow, that sounds like a really big deal. Um, so if I'm not mistaken in the root of that regulated market, uh, the painful situation that you're describing that, that leads to the death spiral, is the original government intervention that guarantees the return 
right? So they have to they have to make good on that. But apparently, <laughs> uh, Bitcoin fixes this too. I guess this is another area of government intervention that Bitcoin subsequently fixes. I guess so. Look, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't look at it that deeply. To, to be honest, I just look at there's a market problem. There's an issue in that market, whether it's due to government or the mm-hmm. incentive structure. I have no firm view on whether a regulated energy market is better than an unregulated mm-hmm. market. I'd probably lean towards unregulated naturally, just let the market be. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a problem objectively that needs to be solved. And, and that's our focus. That's wonderful. I, I no, I'd never heard about that. So it's really cool. Uh, on the topic of regulation, there was a major Bitcoin mining exodus out of China. I guess we're at what? It's been a year, 12, 18 months ago at this point, uh, which was driven by Chinese regulators. How has that impacted the industry? How has that impacted you guys, if at all? Um, and what, you know, what do you think it has done on net for the Bitcoin space? Yeah, it probably was about 12, 15 months ago. You're right. Um, and the, like nothing's changed, right? You look at the hash rate, you look at the network, you know, what, what's the saying? Tick tock, another block. Every 10 minutes, there's another block. It just doesn't matter at a macro level when it comes to Bitcoin. As a Bitcoin miner, it was awesome. It was great. You know, you had 30, 40, 50% of the network wiped out with one stroke, uh, you know, and coming back to how Bitcoin mining works, if every 10 minutes your competition is cut in half and you're finding twice the percentage of that 10 minute block, your revenue lines just doubled. You're making a fortune. And this is why we've been so focused on that social license to operate, that sustainability, that longevity, because this game is just about staying online and keeping that hash rate online and having a social license to do so. Because you go back through history, Bitcoin mining, and you get miners getting chased out of local communities with pitchforks because they're stealing power. And like, it's got a bad name, right? And there's so many issues and sensitivity in this kind of ESG woke world around energy consumption where there's a lot of opportunities to kick own goals. Like people said, oh, why didn't you go and mine in Iran or, um, and get two cent power or go and mine in China and get three cent powers like well guys like that's not how the real world works that doesn't set you up for longevity sustainability particularly attracting attracting institutional capital in fact there was a really good um graphic um that shows gold so it has uh, top five gold producing nations by cost per ounce mine and then on the other side it's got top five gold producing nations by volume by cost is a completely different picture to by volume. By cost, you've got a number of these, I guess, off-piece countries in Africa, at South America, et cetera, where they do in theory have very cheap gold deposits, but the institutional money goes to the US, Canada, Australia, Western economies, and they've got the highest gold producing. There's a reason for that, right? So. It comes back to what's the impact of a market like China or otherwise shutting down. It's like you benefit. So stay online, get that social license to operate, go into a safe jurisdiction, don't take risk. Again, fundamental pillar of our business, strip out risk to stay online, don't kick your own goal. And you benefit from it. From a Bitcoin network perspective, if I zoom out, obviously it's helpful because the more markets mining Bitcoin, I don't necessarily subscribe to it increasing the security and resilience of Bitcoin. I think you can make that argument, but given how hard it is to actually tamper with the network and the whole issues or misconception around a 51% attack, I don't actually think that gives a lot of objective weight, but subjective, it does matter. Um, I think what it does is spread awareness of the asset because you start playing this out and you look at markets like Texas where all of a sudden you've got a new industry that's delivering employment, local taxes, economic activity and people go, whoa, what's this? What's Bitcoin mining? And all of a sudden you, people go, whoa, I've got to learn about this Bitcoin asset. So Bitcoin mining, I'd never thought about this until I, we'd set up IRS and probably 18 months ago and the penny dropped and go, wow, Bitcoin mining and the economic incentives 
is something that's going to drive adoption globally because of the economic incentives associated with converting electricity into Bitcoin and the social wider benefits that brings to a local market where you're going to have government and entrepreneurs and industry turn their heads and have to do the work on Bitcoin. There's a lot of great points there. Um, I, I'm assuming those, those institutional capital flows you described going into the Western world, I mean, this has to do with just the integrity of property rights expected versus trying to put that capital in China or, or somewhere else more authoritarian. Yeah, spot on. I think China specifically has capital controls and prohibitions around foreign ownership, um, mm. which goes beyond just an appetite of um, institutional capital to take risk in those economies. But if you look at every uh, geography or nation globally, there's a risk premium attached to that that institutional capital will right. place. And that goes to your cost of funds, your availability of funds, which then goes to competitive advantage as a business operating in that market. Mm, makes sense. And I love the the idea that Bitcoin mining is kind of like uh, a little economy or industry in a box in a way, right? You just bring it to town, start monetizing that energy, and it creates all of this opportunity for, for local people. And then ultimately, I think, in a way, bootstraps this political support for the network too. Because if it's something that's good for the local population, right, it's generating revenue, creating jobs, prosperity, that the political apparatus comes to like defend the network in that way. And again, this is something that, that Sailor elaborated on, but um, just so interesting, you know, <laughs> it's fascinating what this Bitcoin thing can do. Um, so let me ask you about, so that's a positive externality of Bitcoin mining that we just described, right? Comes to town, can basically set up a, a brand new little micro economy for maybe a, an area that lost its paper mill or whatever, you know, whatever industry they had before that went away, Bitcoin mining um, gives these places a way to get back in the game, so to speak. What are some of the other positive externalities of Bitcoin mining? Um, you know, again, there's the, the dissenters focus very heavily on the negative externality, specifically energy waste or energy consumption. But what are the other positive externalities you see coming out of Bitcoin mining? So again, the wastage of energy argument it, it just doesn't fly and um we've seen a lot of good commentary in um from the existing bitcoin community around this like by definition it does not make sense for bitcoin miners to take power away from other people because by definition that is a higher power cost you are incentivized to find the cheapest form of power by definition that is power that other people don't want like it is just right. logical Right, so Bitcoin mining is incentivized to find wasted energy. The best source of wasted energy on this planet is marginal cost renewables. So where there has been an excess of investment in renewable energy generation that no one is using because marginal cost renewables is very, very low. You've built the capex, the wind blows, the turbines spin, you generate electrons. That is perfect for Bitcoin miners. Go and mop up that surplus power. Now, if you step back and you say, well, what else can Bitcoin do? Bitcoin mining can actually incentivize the next wave of decarbonization, uh, which not only helps energy security issues in the current world, but also seeks to achieve other decarbonization goals that government and society is setting. You say, well, how does that work? So, well, hang on. What we've seen is the first wave of these decarbonisation policies incentivise supply side generation. So provide a subsidy, whether it's renewable energy certificates, feed in tariffs, tax incentive, whatever it is, build out wind farms, solar farms. Well, hang on, there's no one using it. How does that work? And now we've got this market instability where because we've flooded the market with intermittent renewables and no one knows when they're coming, you forced a lot of the baseload power out of business and people have had to shut down the old legacy fossil fuels. And now you've got even more volatility in the market. And they say, right, well, the answer is we need to build more renewables because the more renewables you build, 
the more uh, secure the market gets in a funny way, because market forces mean that, how do I describe this? If you build out a few wind farms and solar farms, you're going to have a supply curve, right? That might look a little bit bumpy like this. The market in a normalized environment will say, well, if there's sufficient demand for that energy and I can sell into that market, how do I fill that gap? And yes, batteries will solve that. But even as a renewable energy developer, which we've been, you go and look at sites that can best fill in that time of day gap. Because not all wind farms in particular, solar is obviously very correlated, but wind isn't. You can go and find a different wind farm a thousand kilometers away in the same market that's got a very different generation profile. So one might be weighted towards generating more during the day. Another might be generating more through the night. And if you just step back, the more of these intermittent generation sources you layer in on top of each other, the, the more they're filling in the gaps and the bigger base rate uh, bedrock you're getting. Right. Now, the issue is there's no demand for power. So there's no incentive for people to build out more renewable generation without taxpayers having to foot the bill again. Bitcoin mining comes along, pays a market price for that power, underwrites the base power price for generation, and then solves any uh, leftover system flexibility issues. So by us going up into this panhandle region of Texas, not only are we using a lot of this surplus wasted power up there today, but as we continue to expand our facilities, we can go to another renewable energy developer, a BlackRock, a Blackstone equivalent, and say, hey, guys, you've got a great site. It's got 200 megawatts worth of wind. You're, you don't have a market price to sell that into, so you can't build it. Why don't we agree to buy that power and give you the price signal so you can bring it online? The existence of that power then provides the opportunity to retire an additional couple of hundred megawatts of base load power. Now, it doesn't actually work that way because of the capacity factor of wind. It might be slightly lower, but you can see the point I'm trying to make. Uh, it's super, super interesting to think of it like that. Um, so, I, I guess energy owners of these energy assets, whether it be wind or solar, they're kind of just leaving money on the table if they're not engaging with Bitcoin mining. Is that, because I, I, they're having to curtail some of this production, I, I assume? Yeah, they are. And look, it's a combination of, they were given handouts by government to build them. Um, so a lot of them are in the money because of that. But then because 10 other people did the same thing, that drove the market price of power lower, which means they all lost. Um, and now they're having to curtail power and get a lower revenue line than what they had initially expected. So at the infrastructure fund, we had a number of wind farms, number of solar farms, and the initial investment case, the 20 year financial model had one set of power price assumptions. 10 other people's had the same. They all built a capacity, leverage those government's incentives. And obviously the revenue line for everyone dropped because of an oversupply of power. Wow, so interesting. Do you then buy into this view that in the long run, Bitcoin mining um, helps accelerate the production of cheaper power? So this is actually, it's, it's created, there's always been an incentive obviously to create cheaper power because energy is an input to every economic activity. But it seems like Bitcoin has perhaps uh, modified or augmented that incentive to make it stronger. Is that something you buy into in the long run? I think it, it is by virtue of those incentives. I mean, it, it, Bitcoin mining is incentivized to find lowest cost, cheapest energy. And if that means developing new energy sources to unlock that, then that's just a natural consequence of that dynamic. So you listen to people like Saylor and Ross Stevens, and they've spoken about the potential of Bitcoin mining to unlock stranded energy, lead to development of energy and civilizations in remote um, places. Absolutely, that you play this out, it's probably a 10, 20 year time frame, which you know, is how we think. But sitting here today, um, you know, the market opportunity to go into these existing energy networks take cheap power solve problems like deal with what's in front of you like there's an enormous opportunity to get cheap power get that social license to operate but as you forecast this out 
you know, if Bitcoin went to just 50% of the market cap of gold, you know, that's $300,000 a coin. That's 15 times the current value. Where do you find another 100 gigawatts of power to support the network? Where do you find another couple of hundred billion dollars of capital to invest? And the issue with power is, yes, the power is available, but is society, is government, uh, is the community going to accept Bitcoin miners rolling into town and just pilfering power and taking it all because they can afford to pay the most for that power in that environment, at least while the market catches up? I, I don't think so. And that's where you might see the incentives, um, from a, again, from a self-interest perspective, to have long-term access to that power mean that you go and start building your own generation to support your operation. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And um, assuming that that is true, Bitcoin has uh, amplified this incentive for us to uncover cheaper energy. I think that would reinforce the positive externalities because, and you mentioned decarbonization. Uh, another thing that came up was desalination of ocean water. My conversation with Jeff Booth, he's making the point that this technology already exists, desalination, decarbonization. Decarbon the problem is energy is too expensive per unit right now to engage these technologies at scale. So assuming Bitcoin helps us get that per unit cost of energy down, it might help us start you know, drinking the oceans and cleaning up the air and all of these things. So um, fascinating to think about. Um, okay. You, all right. Iris Energy recently put out a tweet saying that it was the leader in mining efficiency last month. I think this is in, in reference to May of 2022. And mining efficiency was defined as the number of Bitcoin mined per terahash, which Iris in the tweet, they also said this was a testament to Iris's proprietary data center design model. Clearly, it's a proprietary model, but is there anything you can uh, tell us about or talk about in regards to what you guys are doing to differentiate, differentiate yourself in the space? Uh, yes. So um, in terms of mining efficiency, as you said, it's, it's kind of Bitcoin per output of unit of computing capacity. There's a, um, a Twitter analyst name of Anthony Power that goes through all the listed miners and looks at how much exahash or terahash or petahash they've got installed and how many Bitcoin they're generating. And yes, we've been doing extremely well on that. And look, it's, it's because we invest in proper data centers, like this business has been set up on the basis of not taking shortcuts uh, and managing risk. We don't do shipping containers. Um, you know, anecdotally, every time the ambient temperature hits 27, 28 degrees Celsius, which is what, 70, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, these computers choke on themselves mm. and shut down. And if, if you're only getting 80% uptime, that's an enormous amount of lost Bitcoin and lost revenue that you're receiving uh, from those operations. But one of the biggest impacts for us is the impact on asset life. But these mm. ASICs, they will last a really, really long time, but not if you let them get dusty, humid, let them overheat, choke on themselves. So for us, again, it comes back to building an institutional grade platform, looking after our long-term asset base um, and building proper data centers. So a word on our data centers, um, Brian Fry, one of the um, early strategic shareholders in Iris, he co-founded a company called Rackforce in the early 2000s, which grew to be one of Canada's largest cloud computing data center platforms. Um, so we had a lot of that early data center DNA in the business, and we've just continued to iterate it over the years. Um, you know, we, a couple of that, uh, examples. So we don't rely on the cheap fans attached to the back of these ASICs, you know, the $5 fans, and rely on them to move air through the ASICs. We install large variable speed exhaust fans that are more energy efficient, pull the air through the facility. And then their variable speed, where their intensity ramps up and down in line with the ambient temperature outside to optimize how much power they're actually using. And then another little one in winter um, up in BC, we've noticed that the optimal operating temperature of these ASICs is around 10 degrees Celsius, plus or minus one or two. 
So what that means is when temperatures go sub zero, we've got an automatic recirculation function where some of the output heat here gets automatically recirculated back into the intake to give mm. these chips a bit of a blanket when temperatures go sub zero and keep them operating efficiently. And again, it goes to not just generating more Bitcoin per computer you have installed, but also asset life. Because again, one of the little secrets of these industry is that if you don't do that and you let your chips go sub zero, then the freezing cold can start to crack the ASICs and start breaking them. And again, like that you're in such capital intensive business, you're spending so much money on these computers, look after them. Yeah, wow. That makes a lot of sense. The, um, those wide temperature variabilities, that's what really can hurt the assets, I assume. Um, so you guys have come along and how long has Iris been operating? So we set up about four years ago. Four years. Wow. So you've come a really long way in four years. Um, what do you think, like, I guess, in terms of energy mix today for the global Bitcoin mining network, what do you think that looks like? I don't know if there is good data on this or not. And then where do you see that going? Let's say by the year 2100, how do you think that energy mix will change um, on the global Bitcoin mining network? 2100, talk about low time preference. Um, <laughs> haven't quite played that out. I think, um, look, there's a lot of people that have pulled data together. It's hard, right? Because it's so anecdotal, it's so private. Um, it's not like aluminium smelting um, where you can go and commission a consultant report that can build up cost quartiles, analyze facilities by cost base, et cetera, look at their inputs. It's, um, Look, I think if you step out, I think a lot of those reports talk about the majority and a significant majority being renewable energy. But I think if you step back and you look, well, what's happening in the world? Commodity prices, inflation, input costs are going up. Cost of renewable energy and that marginal cost of renewable electrons has not gone up. It is the same because you've already invested in that capacity. So it stands to reason that the network today is further decarbonizing and becoming greener because miners that are using fossil fuels are now becoming less competitive because their input costs are going up. And as we've seen over the last little while, two of the last three difficulty adjustments have been downwards. Despite all these new ASICs arriving for us, other listed players that were ordered six, 12 months ago, and have been installed, the network hash rate is still going down despite that, indicating that high cost miners are not able to pay their power bill and they're having to switch off. Now, if commodity prices are going up, it stands to reason that the higher cost miners are likely the ones that are exposed to that. So I think that natural um, evolution is happening at the moment. If you play that out longer term, I think it goes a lot to what society wants. If society wants a decarbonized trajectory to incentivize wind and solar, Bitcoin miners are going to be there to buy that as a uh, buyer of last resort because the marginal cost of every spare electron is so low. Um, if, if we're going down a pathway of digging up more fossil fuels and burning it, then I think not only the environmental costs are being factored in, but you've got a commodity price that needs to be paid for as well. And by definition, that's going to be more expensive. Interesting. So of the, of, between fossil, fuel, fossil fuels, wind and solar, are there, I think the last time I looked at this, solar had the, the most quickly uh, dropping per unit price of the three. Is that accurate? And then if, if, that is accurate would that lend us to believe more bitcoin mining would um drift towards solar in the longer run if that uh trend continued yeah that's right because if you look at wind versus solar wind's very mechanical you know large engineering motors turbines etc whereas solar pv is more on the technology side like how do you assemble the silicon how do you engineer it to get more efficiency uh, in terms of transposing that light into electricity. So yes, the technology gains and the efficiency gains have been higher um, associated with 
solar going forward, whether that's plateau, whether that will continue, humans will continue to innovate. So you would expect it um, to continue. So energy will go to where it is treated best on the Bitcoin mining network, I guess, <laughs> in terms of buying and selling. Um, okay. What, I guess this is one last general question here. What is it like working in Bitcoin mining? What, I mean, seems like you probably travel a little bit to go to some of these sites. Um, how has the industry changed since you've been in and um, where do you see it going in the future? Yeah, people often ask, where am I based? And I say, yeah, unfortunately on an aeroplane. Um, feels like it's the case most of the time. The, uh, the family's in, in Sydney. Um, but spent a lot of time, particularly in North America. Look, it, it's, it's a fantastic industry. And, and it's kind of funny at the moment, you know, we're sitting here with Bitcoin at twenty twenty one thousand dollars $21,000 a coin. Everyone's like, Bitcoin's dead. You know, everyone's selling off NASDAQ, selling off technology, selling off crypto, selling off Bitcoin miners. And we're sitting here going, we're still making good money. Like our cost of production is like eight, nine thousand dollars a coin, and the price is twenty. Well, like that's fifty percent EBITDA margins. Most manufacturing businesses would kill for that type of margin. <laughs> and we can continue to invest. And yes, Bitcoin goes back to sixty-seven thousand dollars. We're obviously going to be crushing it and loving life. But even today, it's you know we've got about a hundred people. Globally, in our organization, um, a lot of them traditional energy infrastructure, data center, renewable energy backgrounds, and by and large, they just love what they do. We're building, we're growing. We know that we've got industry leading infrastructure that's paving the way. We're seeing that cash flow and that Bitcoin mind generating. So there's that near term gratification where validation of what we're doing is contributing direct value. Um, and it's a really interesting industry where, like ourselves, Will and I, where we went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, love the asset, how do we do more? It's, it's actually attracting others in a similar position that are coming out of other industries, energy, manufacturing, uh, a lot of defence people, interestingly, out of the Air Force and the Army, and saying, Bitcoin, I understand it. How do I get more involved? And Bitcoin mining is a real world business that I can sink my teeth into. So you do come across a lot of cool people. That's super cool. Sounds like a fun job and a fun space, um, all for helping build a bright orange future. So Dan, I've learned a lot in this conversation, man. I really appreciate it. Um, grateful for the work you're doing and hopefully this conversations useful for other people that want to get into Bitcoin mining or just learn about it. Um, if you could, please let my audience know where they could find out more about you or your work if they are so interested. Sure. Um, so we're on Twitter. Iris Energy Co. is the, uh, the company handle. And then Dan Roberts 0101, I think from memory, uh, is my handle. Um, Robert, it's been a pleasure. Uh, really enjoyed chatting with you over the journey and enjoy the work you do more broadly. And um, as I said at the outset, very pleased and delighted to join you today. Thank you, Dan. Pleasure's all mine. We'll do it again soon. Look forward to it.